Hello, Next Geners. Welcome to our Thursday form preview show. Normally we're on a Friday, but tomorrow night is the Moya Stakes. And in fact, I think Thursdays are better because it gives you guys an extra 24 hours before the weekend to help compile your form. And we've got one of the best form students in the game. He's a manager of the stars. He's the manager of James McDonald, who rides the group one favourite Animo in the Golden Rose. Guesty, Mark Guest, welcome to the Next Gen Show. Yeah, thanks very much, Damien Hayden. Uh, good to be here and uh, looking forward to the next how long it takes to we, uh, to we finish. Mate, great to have you on. Uh, last couple of weeks, we've had on uh, Jason Richardson and David Gately, who are um, both professionals in the game. But I think as a jockeys manager, doing the form must be a little bit different because you're probably, you're probably um, doing reviews more so than previews and, and trying to plan ahead when you're looking for rides for your jockey. So tell us, what does it look like for you when you're doing the form? Well, first of all, you're going from Richo to Gailey. Now you're going down the scrape in the bottom bottom of the barrel with me. With me. But anyway, yeah, it's a different... With jockey managing, I suppose, I'm always watching him every day. I'm in front of the, um, in front of the TV and uh, just constantly making notes on different horses that are running. And uh, that that's every day, every day of the week. I mean, obviously, some, some Sundays you, you want to have... You might want to watch a movie or something, but generally someone's sending you a message or something. You see that horse or whatever it may be. So you, you're always you're always watching races and it never stops uh, because the phone can ring any time. And as uh, most of the managers out there, if any are watching, they know that um, you, you're always on. So it's uh, it is a job that's not for everybody. Like if I was married or you know or whatever, or had a partner. Well, then it'd probably make it a bit difficult, you know, living with someone. But living on my own, I think it makes it, uh, I don't have anyone whinging in my ear. And are you looking, are you doing the form to find rides for your jockeys or is it more so um, to actually see how the horse runs and, and maybe um, share a few pointers with the jockeys on what you see on how a horse, you know, profiles? I, I think, yeah, you're always looking for um, horses that can, you know, that races looking ahead, at races that you think maybe your jockeys could uh, ride in that race. Uh, I think when it, in regards to form, it's a different situation because you wait for the acceptances to come out and then you're working through the, through the form. And it's too difficult. Otherwise, you know, that horse is good. It ran well, but unless you see the field in front of you, it's just very hard to line up. You, know, you hear people say, Oh, it'll win next start, but you don't know. Sometimes you do, but you don't always know what they're meeting. Their opposition is next start. How often are you ringing trainers or are trainers more often ringing you? Uh, I think, you know, with um, James McDonald, for instance, it's, you know, obviously, you know, he's, everyone wants James. Um, with Robbie Dolan and also Fred Kersley, you know, there's a bit more of, of myself uh, calling and, um, you know, like building relationships with certain trainers and uh, and the same with the boys. I mean, it's it's very difficult from, from the... McDonald's, you know, he's got at the pinnacle, uh, whereas uh, the two young guys, um, they're working their way through it. They're going super. Uh, but, you know, you need the support. And, you know, a manager can't really lift a bloke up who's not really doing the work. And that's what uh, I really like about these young guys coming through, like Robbie and Fred. They're hard workers. And, and I think, you know, as any jockey could, could would say these days, you really have to work hard to um, – and then hopefully they believe that you've got the right ability – to put on their horses, so it's a you know it's a it's a tough game in a lot of ways, uh, but they've got to look at it as a job, not not as something where I'm going to go out and be a rock star. I think it's uh, if they you know put their head down. Trainers love that when you they're working very hard. Well, it's um, you know, they can get rewarded being in the right place at the right time. And I think uh, the jockeys that I've got, the two younger ones, yeah, they 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 fit that bill. You know, working hard, have that work ethic. And uh, I think you need to do that these days, apply yourself. I mean, McDonald, he's at the top, but he's working as hard as the young jockeys are. He's, if not harder, you know, he's, he's going all the time. And I suppose it's a bit easier when you've got the plum rides in front of you and it probably makes it a bit easier to get out of bed in the morning and go down to track work. Um, uh, but the, the young guys, not once have they whinged at all. And which you'd expect there to be some whinging over the time. Aiden on face value. It looks like J-Mac's got another good book of rides on Saturday. 
Yeah, this time of year for um, James, especially the form he's in, it doesn't. It feels more like um, how many winners will James ride rather than will James ride one. He's blessed with opportunities at the moment. Obviously, when you've got great rapports with Bo Dolphin and with Chris Waller, there's an expectation that there's going to be a good horse there for you every week. Um, but Mark, when it comes to a horse like Zaki, how much work does Mark Guest do getting a ride on a horse like Zaki when there isn't the level of expectation that James will get it being the number one stable rider? Oh, I think when you're talking about the, those uh, those horses, I mean, generally, Mac's all over it. J-Mac, he's so thorough with um, with the form. He watches it every day. Uh, it's ama- I'm amazed at just the horses he can recall. With, with, I just mentioned, uh, did you see that horse? And he'll know the horse. He'll know everything about the breeding and everything. It's just... He's unbelievable like that. So he's got a great relationship with most trainers. And so, you know, he's in constant contact. So really, I mean, yeah, they might call me and say, look, I'm keeping in mind for this this galloper or whatever it may be, like a, like a Zaki, for instance. Uh, but with that galloper, what happened last year was it ran very well on the Doncaster. And then all of a sudden, I have uh, I've gave Annabelle a call and said, James is available for the next race. And she said, I'll come back to you or whatever, or, or the, um, the racing manager, and, and said, yeah, you can ride it. So Todd Pollard it was. Um, so he could ride it. And next thing he got on the horse and, and the rest is history. And then this weekend, um, as Hayden said, Godolphin versus Waller, in a sense, when, when J-Max got the pick, does, does it ever get a bit frosty when you've got to, um, got to pick between powerhouses like that? Well, we didn't have to choose in this particular occasion because Zaki was going down to Melbourne. But, yeah, I mean, there's always – you've just got to weigh everything up. And uh, one thing that I keep – and I tell other trainers, and that is James wants to win. So yeah. it's pretty important that he uh, rides the horse that's going to win the race, you know, and that's um, that's something that James he gets the biggest thrill out of. I mean, yeah, I mean, he earns, you know, a good, a good income. Uh, but it's sort of like he's got that income, but – Winning races is, is what he gives him the biggest thrill. You know, you can you can have as much income as you want, but winning the races is um, is the most exciting thing for him. From from what he, he tells me. Well, there's some big races this weekend. One of them is the Golden Rose that James runs in. How do you dissect the form when you um when you see acceptances and the barriers come out? Well, um, I as a uh, jockey manager in Sydney, uh, I'm not allowed to um, talk about the Sydney races. And I can't do any form on the races. Well, I can, but I can't give anyone any information as far as when I say information, what I like or why I like this horse or that horse. So I've okay. got to concentrate on Melbourne. Um, there's just the only the rule came in a couple of years ago, and so we're not allowed to talk about um, any uh, any of my jockeys that are riding in a race in Sydney or in New South Wales, rather. I, I'm not I'm not allowed to talk about. It. So unfortunately, you know, I'd like to, um, but I but they've told us that it's not. It's um, it could be misleading or whatever it may be, you know. So anyway, we just got to they're the rules and you've got to abide by them, and uh, you know that's uh, that's just the way it is. All right. Well, tomorrow night's the Moya Stakes. Um, there's still a few slots to go in the Everest. J Max pretty much guaranteed to ride Nature Strip in the Everest, I assume. Uh, Nature Strip, yeah, that's right. He'll um, he'll go. Well, I believe he's going straight into it. Um, so that'll be uh, that's. Uh, a galloper he's look, really looking forward to uh, to riding. Um, so anyway, well, that's a, that's a few weeks away. So anything can happen. We know it's horse racing. Anything can happen from one week to the uh, to the next. But the Moya Stakes tomorrow, yeah, like you said, the, the Moya Stakes tomorrow night. I can't wait for it. It's uh, it looks a really good field. In fact, the whole program looks pretty good. Uh, for you know, you'd expect it though. It's the first uh, first Group One in uh, at Mooney Valley for the uh, for the night season. It kicks off the night night racing season. It's, uh, I used to love going out to the Valley you know, back when it started in 1998 when um, Shane Dye won the first race. And it was, um, I think he won the feature too on Stella, Stella Cadonte. And I think Vitronite won the first, the first race at Mooney Valley. So it was, uh, I loved, I used to love going there. There used to be a nightclub there, boys, uh, called uh, Cafe Cosmo. And then it, uh, they changed it into 2040 Club. But it was always, uh, it was it was just the highlight of the whole uh, the whole night, really. I mean, it was great. The races were great, but everyone <laughs> would stick around. Everyone would stick around and go to the nightclub afterwards. And, you know, we didn't shut till one o'clock. 
So it was a pretty a, a, a lot of messy nights had at Mooney uh, at Mooney Valley at the uh, at Cafe Cosmo. But tomorrow night with the uh, the good horses running, people can't get there, of course. But the good horses running, it always um, has the, uh, the excitement flowing. I normally then, go I normally go a little bit later into uh, an interview with a guest, but you sort of you've dangled the carrot out there, and I'm going to bite. If we got a Cafe Cosmo story that we wouldn't tell on something like a Sky Channel that we might be able to let out on a Next Gen show. Ah, uh, oh gee, you put me on the spot. Uh, not really a story, but I'm sure anyone out there that remembers uh, Cafe Cosmo that was there, there was a lot of beer was drunk after the uh, after the last race. In fact, I couldn't have a drink because I was working during the night in Cafe Cosmo as the tipster. Right. And then, uh, and then it, after that, well, then, you know, you let your hair down a bit. And um, I'm, I can tell you that uh, that was normally on a, I think they did vary the night. So there was some Thursdays, Fridays. I'm trying to think if there was any other nights, maybe a Wednesday or something. But, but yeah, it was, uh, I know there's plenty of headaches the next, uh, the next day, but I can't, not one particular story uh, does sound, uh, stand out, but, uh, but they were great times. I mean, I, I think, you know, I know they still have, uh, 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 venues at the at the track where you can get to after you know after the last or whatever it may be and it's always good to catch up with people you hadn't seen i mean everyone's pretty serious during the daytime when they're, they're punting i mean it's the worst thing you can do is bet and drink at the same time as um, most will tell you and because you know you're just not you don't have your head on right unless you've got someone next to you who's helping you um with the uh, with the tips but yeah so um now i haven't really hey no i haven't really uh, got a story that uh, i've can, that stands out in my mind, but there's um, there's just plenty of I know there's plenty of people that met at Cafe Cosmo that are still together. Well, um, we'll step away from that. We'll come back to you at the end yeah. of the interview into a story that you, you you kept put your thinking cap on. You might be able to tell um, everybody <laughs> something about. Um, there's, but there's been plenty of mentions of overseas trips, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where. Um, I've been um, I've had the luxury of having a drink or two with you in the past and. You know, it only took a couple of reds or a couple of um, drinks in for Mark Guest to turn into the best. And once the best came out, it was trouble. So I'll let you uh, think about a story that you might be able to tell at the end. When it comes to the form point, um, you've been renowned for a long time in um, all forms of media as being a very respected judge, respected analyst, respected tipster and punter. Um, for those newer into the sport, how does Mark Guest go about it? You know, from the start, what sort of tools do you use? How do you analyse a race and how do ultimately do you come up with some of your selections? Yeah, well, look, it's, uh, I've been in this, I've been in media since 1996 and it was a, you know, it was a tough, tough road into the media. Before that, I was, um, I was working with stewards, doing stewards films and uh, photo finish operating. That's where I started in 1984. And, I did that for 12 years, all going around to every country uh, racetrack. So I did probably 12 years, maybe a bit more when I came back in for a couple of years, but I probably, I was doing over 300 meetings a year in ho for horse racing. And then I was doing trots as well. And I was also doing the Greyhound. So I had a, had a good grounding into, um, into what I was doing, what I wanted to do later, media, like as far as um, my contacts in the sport and all three codes actually at the time, I got to know a lot of people and made a lot of good friends. And then uh, 1996, I, I had to get out of um, what I wanted, what I was doing, and I wanted to get into media, and I started my, my own TV show. And then I wasn't really doing a heap of form. I was doing the odd bit of form, like most people do at home, you know, like they're, they're sitting with the newspaper and look through it, and you might have got the best bets and, and look through that as well. So you weren't really doing it on your own. You were sort of getting an idea. Your, your selections were your own, but you weren't doing it in depth as what uh, as what we all we all do now, but how I'd, uh, mine's sort of a bit old school. I was taught by a guy called Kim Telford and he was one of the best, um, first track walkers uh, in Victoria. And also one of the, uh, the first, um, him and the Colonel, who was his uh, relative of his, uh, and he, they, um, and they were very, they were brilliant at what they did back in the, uh, back in the early, late sixties and, uh, and the seventies. And they, they did so well at their, their form analyzing and, and, and what they did. And they sort of, he, well, Kim taught me, um, basically how he did the form and I sort of followed on from that. And that is when the, when the fields come out, I'd sit down and I'd start with a, um, a speed map. So then I'd, uh, I'd go through every horse and work out, you know, and watch the replays where they sit, where they sit, sit and whatever. And then I put the speed map down on, on paper. And from there, I'd then uh, go through each horse, but I'd start at the bottom, never start at the top. 
because so many times you miss, you get a bit, you could be get a bit tired towards the end of the race and you think, yeah, oh, I can't win, I can't win because number 15 on number 16. But always start at the bottom because the better horses generally are up the top and you work your way up. So, you, you I mean, it's just, that's how I've been taught anyway to do it. So you will start at the bottom and work your way up through, um, through each horse. Now, what I do with, say, I look at horse number five. Now, what I'll do, I'll go back and look at all his best runs. And when and when he ran that certain um, race, how good it was, go back and watch the replay and then work out how long ago it was because it could have been three years ago. And do you think, you know what, his form's not as good as back what it was back then. So that's just something you know. And you make these little notes down on your on your uh, form printout about how, about that sort of stuff. And then you go through them bit by bit and then you, you see it's worse runs, obviously. But obviously you do pay attention to the last few runs that generally most people do because that's where, you know, they, that's their form, isn't it? But I wouldn't discount things from, from beforehand. And especially if they're first up some pays to look, go back and look at some of their, uh, their first up runs. So what I do with that, and then I, what I do, I work out uh, who, who's the chance. And then I go back and look at things like um, the previous meetings at Caulfield, where the track, how the track played, uh, the rail, what position the rail was in, and work out, you know, is, was that a track that day? And normally they tend to sort of go, act the same way. If, they were, if the rail was at five or six metres and what it was a few starts ago, it generally played the same, like it might have been on paces or whatever it may have been. So you start getting that. Now, that, that this is back in the day, though, and, and you start getting that sort of idea. So you start working out in your head how this race is going to be run. You've got your speed map. So then you start getting an idea, well, this horse can't win. Then you start putting a line through the, the speed map and saying, well, they they can't win, those ones back in the in the field. So all that sort of thing. But now with with the different um, form um, that's out there, like all the different the sectionals come into it uh, big time. They always did, but we didn't really have access to them. But now that we do, it's um, it's a great tool to have, to have the, um, the sectionals that we do have just to go through them. And just to, it backs up your judgment. Another thing I like to do is with um, any race, I like to frame a market. So I'll try and frame it to 100%. And then you then generally, you know, if your horse is worth worth backing. I mean, it's no point um, putting money on something you think it's a you know four dollar chance and it's two dollars fifty. I mean, I mean you can. Most people, some people say oh, I just want to back the winner, but I even even if I tipped it on top. Well, we know that's not what you call value. So it's um, but it takes a lot of time, guys, to um, as you'd be aware of, just doing that, going through them and, and and mapping out the price that they should be. But it really gives you a once you do the prices and you've gone through each runner and you've got your speed map, it gives you a real handle on the on the actual race. But the problem is the thing about it, which people don't, you've got to have the real. How can I say it? You've got to sit there in front of this um, computer and work it all out. One race could take you an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. So it can take a fair while to um, to sort out one particular race. Is it move, this picture moving? I think I'm moving the. It's not another earthquake, is it? No, I don't think. So. No, we no aftershock here. No, so that's so it's a it's t it's tedious in a lot of ways. You've got to really love the sport to to keep doing it. It's just one of those uh, things. But one thing about I think horse racing's done. I, I said when I started back in 1996, as far as the the media is concerned. One thing when I started, there was no opportunities for younger people to get involved in horse racing. And the older brigade, the older people that were there, they were no help. Uh, there was a few, but very few. It was sort of like, what's this young bloke trying to come into come into our sport and and, and have a go? It just you weren't given opportunities. And uh, I think anyone back then, my age, would would even account for that. I mean, the fact that the eighties, they didn't even want you to uh, join a, a race club. You got to wait in line, all this sort of stuff. Wait your turn, son. So my generation and the one after it, maybe even the one before it, it was just it was just missed. So you guys are in a, a great situation. I think the last 20 years, uh, racing's opened itself up to uh, young people getting involved in the sport. I mean, when I did that TV show back in 96, I had all these young people involved who are now involved in, ho in horse racing in a big way. They were on the on the TV show back then, but no, and only the only the chief of the uh, the RVL, Brian Beatty. He helped me out, and uh, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be where I am now as far as um, getting my uh, head into different uh, places in the media like Best Bets and the Truth newspaper and all these type of uh, type of places that I was working at, at race clubs I was working at, doing, you know, like stuff like Cafe Cosmo. So I gradually built on from that. But if I – but I was trying to, you know, like bring young people into the sport and, and get a hand, but no one would give us a hand at all. So 
I mean, that was very frustrating in those days. And I'm glad that it's turned around and it's given opportunities to everyone coming through because they realised, finally realised that, hang on, we've missed two generations. Let's let's give these young people a go that are really, you know, are, are doing their best. And we can't afford to get rid of people in the sport. We can't afford to just, you know, wipe them aside. And it, every person's important that loves horse racing because we know it used to be the third biggest sport in Australia in the 50s. It was, you know, the betting rings and whatever. I don't remember the 50s, but obviously you see pictures in your videos. But, yeah, I mean, we, we wanted to get back up there. We will never be like it was. I mean, but we wanted to get to the stage where, People are talking about it. And with guys like you who are passionate about it, I think it's a great thing. And I think there's a lot of people out there, young people coming through. You see them on social media. And it's great to see that they're, um, you know, they've invested in horse racing, love having a bet, and they love to talk about it. So it's, um, you know, it's a testament to you guys who are putting in all the work. Just on that, Gessie, what do you make of um, Volandi's uh, pop-up races, the Everest, the Golden Eagle, which are targeted at um, or meant to be targeted at guys our age? Uh, you know, I've got no problem with um, trying something new. I mean, I think the the Everest has been a revelation. I mean, yes, it was over in it started as the um, over in America. What was that race called in Florida? Um, the Pegasus. Mm. Yeah, that's how it started, and yep. you know, uh, Peter picked up on it and ran with it, and it worked. It's it's worked so far. Got the best horses in Australia running in the Everest, and I don't mind them so much. I think I'd ra I'd like to see both states working in together really well because when I was growing up, and I know. Uh, that's where you sort of you, you, the romance is when you sort of started. I mean, when I started, when I was in the late seventies, as far as the be, my the era I liked, you know, I love to see Sydney horses or in the eighties as well coming to Melbourne and vice versa. It was a real talking point, and it wasn't like a us versus them. It was just a I love competition and I love sport, and I even like sport. You know, any sort of sport where Victoria took on New South Wales or any other state. And that's what I think, you know, what, what I like to, you know, that's what I loved about the sport. Now, with these races that are on the same day, I think it's very disappointing in some ways that they can't make it. Let's do it like they do in Europe. Have Saturday uh, Melbourne, Sunday Sydney. Next year, have it Sunday Caulfield Cup, Saturday the Everest and vice versa. And I think we should do that. That way the trainers, best trainers can get to the meetings and the best jockeys can get there and ride the, and ride, and ride the horses. I know there's a flip side of the, the argument. I get that. But I, I feel that we need the best always at the, at our you know our biggest meetings. And I I do get the fact also that the reason why they don't do it is because of the um the money, you know, as far as yeah. the turnover. Yeah, it's not as it's not as great, you know, on those on those Sundays. But maybe we just have to bite the bullet and try it one time with one of yeah. the uh, the biggest meetings and, and that way, you know, you've then I, then you or me or whatever can fly one day we could fly to Sydney and go to the Everest and then we could come back down to Melbourne and watch the Caulfield Cup. Yeah. We want to be at these meetings. They're fantastic. I've been at a few Everest and they're fantastic. But, you know, and, and, and the Caulfield Cup, I mean, it's in my backyard. I just love the Caulfield Cup. And it's a shame that I have to choose between one race or the other. I just, I don't like the clashing. I love the idea and I love what Peter's doing, but I don't like, I just don't like the clashing at all. Because where, does it, where do you draw the line? Melbourne next are going to put on a derby next year on, on AGC Derby Day and run it for five yep. million and get all the horses because Australia, Victoria, Melbourne has the best weather, as we know, in, in, uh, in March and some part of April. And we normally get yeah. good tracks that time of year. So you'll get a lot of the people that don't want to run these wet tracks in Sydney, they'll come down to Victoria and run and run in Victoria. But I don't like the – I like competition if it's healthy, but I, I'd rather separate all the good horses so they could – all you know, just so we could get to all these meetings. And imagine that every weekend – having a, a great a Super Saturday and a Super Sunday. It would be fantastic for the sport, I think, but maybe the turnover would tell us something different. Yeah, and I, I put a bit of a controversial tweet out yesterday about the Underwood. I'd love to see Zaki and incentivise clash, but I just think there's too many mile to 2,000 metre wait for age races where the best horses aren't meeting with each other. They're sort of running on parallel weekends rather than up against each other. Hopefully we see some of those good horses clash um, in a Cox plate. Um, so let's look at the Moyer Stakes because there is plenty of different form lines. You've got Profiteer, who's the, um, the two-year-old, now three-year-old, um, returning to the track uh, against horses like uh, September Run, Portland Sky and the Inferno, who have had a run this prep. Wild Ruler, I thought, was pretty good behind nature strip first up and then you've got um sorry trekking was in that race as well so there's a few different form lines to line up here yeah look uh, i'm 
I always wait for age races. I always look down the bottom when there's three year olds, especially good three year olds. And Profiteer, I mean, he's got 52. He looks like he's going to lead and he's going to be hard to grab. I mean, with 52 kilograms, we know he's got the super speed and they've been to the valley with him and he's looked all right around the valley. So I, it's very hard to tip against him when you've got that weight and he's got that class about him. And we saw what he did in the uh, in the Tobman, um, you know, and he's probably a bit he's past it in the uh, in the Golden Slipper. But uh, I, I think it's very hard to just go past him. When you look at last year's uh, race, Pippi won it last year, was that right? Pippi yep, that's went right. out in front on its own. Well, Pippi wasn't a, a, a three-year-old, but still just was able to run him along. I know yep. they didn't go super hard, uh, but still, I mean, if Profiteer can get some sort of lead like that, like Pippi did, and, and run out as quickly as she did, well, it's going to take a really good horse to run her down. Now, obviously, there's there's some great opposition. Uh, a lot of those are going to be near to to um, to um, uh, Profiteer, like Portland Sky. I think you're going to see a lot of improvement. Yeah. Portland Sky, you work forward and might slide into a spot just behind the uh, behind the leaders, and then just whether I just can't remember the next line. I haven't got the sheet in front of me. I'll put the speed map there. But there's um, Shakira could kick up from the barrier. It's drawn two or something, but it couldn't. It wouldn't have the speed of Profiteer. Yeah, wild got, ruler, uh, maybe. Wild ruler, there's another one. Wild ruler will be handy ish. Uh, there's one who's going to sit outside Profiteer. There's another one that's going to, um, uh, is it? Uh, yeah, so, Miss Albania, yeah, and Ballistic Love yeah. is the interesting one from um, Joseph yes. Pride Stable. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it'll be, I could see Ballistic Lover being, say, third back outside around that sort of uh, sort of position. One I've got a bit of time for, uh, I mean, they've all got, got some uh, good records, but the one I really uh, like the way it's coming along and, and just was very keen on a jump out was what's that? I think she's going to you know, step up to a different level, this uh, this preparation. She uh, she looked very good the other day in that jump out and there were some uh, handy horses behind her in the jump out. So um, I think she'll run very well if uh, Damien can get her into a, a reasonable position, Damien Oliver, that is, in a reasonable uh, position. Yeah, and Wild Ruler's one that, that J-Mac has ridden a few times. I think he had two wins on the horse um, last prep, only 12 starts for five wins. Yeah, but, I mean, it's going to position up into a good spot. I mean, it did chase home uh, one of the, the sprinters, Australia's best sprinter mm. uh, last time and, and didn't have a great deal of luck in that race either. Um, not saying it would have won, but it was still a very good run. And, you know, the, the Snowden's a very good place. Uh, play, they place their horses very well. Uh, there's no doubt Wild Ruler will run a, a pretty good race. But I think, you know, you're, even others back in the field, like Trekking ran second in the last last year to um, to Pippi. September run, drawn barrier one. I don't think that's an ideal, might not be an ideal um, spot. Yeah. You might have to look for some, you know, just some opening there in the uh, in the straight. And then uh, Brooklyn Hustle, I thought its trial, it looked pretty good winning the uh, winning the trial. Dice roll was in that, um, that uh, trial, of course. Uh, and he came out and ran pretty good in a handicap race. But she's um, she's going well. So there's uh, you know I'm sure there's going to be there's a fair few people out there who have their different you know, reasons why they think um, one can win. But I just feel Rock Profiteer might be in the right uh, in the right spot leading. Uh, and Zaki just wins the Underwood. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if if and he has to do what he's doing. I mean, he, and he'll win. You think? Um, now he's a very exciting horse and. He, he's probably the most, um, you know, the most talked about horse in Australia with very elegant right at the moment. So it's um, it's very hard to see him losing. Although they do say, um, be careful of the small the small fields, don't they? I mean, you, you never know. It's a horse race, but it will. Regardless of that, it's going to be exciting. And and when we watch good horses, it's always uh, exciting to watch. I can remember uh, Rubiton going down years ago when he was a dollar sixty favourite or dollar fifty favourite. I think Drought beat him, and uh, that was a big shock. So. Upsets can happen. That was a core field. But um, you never know. It's a horse race. So it's, uh, it will be great to watch. He's, uh, he's so exciting. Hey, it's, one, it's one of those races. Um, one of those races you you got to be um, a little bit different upstairs to be stepping into a horse in a five-horse race at $1.20. Um, you know, you've got to love a margin and be uh, desperate to get it. The reason, you know, people always talk about small fields, be careful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think David Gately referred to it last week. Small fields, slow tempos, et cetera. You don't have to be the best athlete. You might just have to be the fastest horse over 400 metres. And yeah. that can undo some of them. Um, 
especially when you get into races of this ilk. Um, you know, Craig Williams steps out on a Zaki, huge expectation, and everywhere he looks, he's got Brett Preble, Damian Oliver, Damian Lane, John Allen. Like, you, we've got a couple of the best tactical riders in the country, not only just in Victoria, but in the country. And they go into um, races like this knowing their horses. They know the little chinks in the armour of Zaki, if there is one. Um, you know, Damien is... Um, Damien's a master under these sort of circumstances. Him on a horse like Superstorm, who doesn't um, have to overexert early, Damien will probably be aware that Superstorm's likely got the best 400-metre kick in the race. It's superior to a horse like Zaki. We haven't had um, Zaki under conditions where they're going hurdle speed. Typically, horses like Zaki are asked to go genuine group one weight for age tempo. So that's the only thing that could possibly undo him. Um, if the race is genuine, he'll beat them by that far, um, he'll be able to ease him down, up off him and walk him back and they'll still be coming. Uh, that, that's the only thing that could possibly beat him. So in terms of betting in the race, you've got to be pretty keen taking him <laughs> 20. Yeah, I, if you make that argument, yes. I mean, but I, I think he's, I think Craig just leads on him and, and he'll just win. I mean, that's what I feel is going to happen. Uh, but I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not one to bet anything really short i mean i'm not um i'm not a mad punter either but i'll, I'll pick out my bets what i want to do i, I like playing quaddies uh but the uh and i i can sit there and watch good horses all day long and not have a bet because i just love you know, watching good racing good competitive races and a lot of the time i'm uh, too i'm making notes on different horses and because obviously i've got the jockeys in mind so so i've uh it's as you know it's one thing to do the form and do it properly or what you consider properly and there's another thing being a punter. Now, some people are just brilliant punters and they've just got the fear, they're fearless and you've got to be fearless, I think. But if you've if you got that mentality, it's it's amazing what you could you could turn something into, into anything. Uh, but I'm not, I'm very, I'm conservative, uh, very conservative when it comes to that sort of thing. But anyway, that's all, uh, we're all different, I suppose. But I like, I still like doing the form, even if I'm not going to have a bet on the race. I, I like uh, doing the form and it keeps my eye in. Uh, they say that if you go, if you um, you're just sitting there doing nothing most of the time, you you could end up um, in a um, you know in a bad situation. I'm talking about health wise, as far yeah. as um, you know. They say with even with Alzheimer's and all these sort of things, they, they say you should keep your your mind ticking over. And it's one thing with um, horse racing uh, people; they're always looking at the form and looking at who can do what. So and there's always something different. So that's a that's probably really good for your health long term, really. I mean, it's probably not good for your nerves <laughs> over the uh, over the time. I mean, I've had some, I've had some um, near misses uh, really over the over the years. A couple of near misses. Oh, not not big, not huge money. We're, we're talking, but back in the day, it was a bit of money. It was about twenty seven thousand in nineteen ninety one when I had a good chance to win so, so that sort of money for on for five dollars. I had a quaddy at Colac on Colac Cup Day, and I was filming for the stewards, and I was watching the race head on and filming. And I had um, True Novel was the horse. Les Beer was riding it, and he got held up on the turn, and got beaten about that much. And I was, I was, I was just sick. Twenty seven. So from five dollars, when it was a ten, was a fifty cent unit, I had a game for twenty seven thousand. So it was, um, that was a, that would have been a really big help because that the next year, I um, was going to Barcelona to, um, you know, for the and also to France for about three months for a holiday. And, and I was going to the Olympics to, to watch the Olympics because I love sports. And that 27 would have come in very handy, let me <laughs> tell you. Because I, I did do it. I did camp in Barcelona at uh, Casta del Fels. So it was a, um, a lot of camping done. But I think I would have had a, a different <laughs> so, sort of time if I had the, uh, the 27,000. I would have been staying in nice hotels and all that sort of thing. But you know what? It was an experience back then. I mean, staying in all these camping grounds around, uh, around Barcelona while the Olympics was on, it was a... It was a big, uh, it was a big thrill. Let me tell you, when you, um, you know, you'd never been to an Olympics before and and saw you know, Olympic Christie and those sort of uh, people racing. But I didn't have. I wanted to see uh, who was a who won the United Two in the. It was a, Kieran Perkins. I think he might have won the. Yeah, he won the swimming, and the um, and it was the dream team from. And I got offered a ticket for seventeen hundred dollars. So obviously, I mean, I'm camping. You think I'm going to pay seventeen hundred dollars? to um to to um watch the uh, dream team but if you had the twenty seven thousand, would have been very a different story Absolutely. let me give you a hypothetical guesty if if yep. j mac 
was able to come to Melbourne and ride in a Cox Plate, would you be advising him to ride Zaki or Very Elegant? Well, that's uh, taken out of my hands because Damien Lane's booked on Very Elegant for both races, isn't he? I think he's already booked on her. So there's no, I don't have to make that decision or anything like that. Or That would be a bit of a headache. Oh, no I, could help. I could have helped you with that decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because if it's dry, she's... Oh, she, right. Yeah, if it's yeah. dry, she won't get near him. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, but how do you... How do you... If you're trying to make the decision when people want to know three weeks in advance or whatever it may be, how, see, we make decisions two to three weeks in advance. Uh, and especially bigger races, sometimes even, you know, maybe four weeks. Oh, very rarely, but it does happen. So, yeah, if you know that what the weather's going to be, I might call you now for now, Aiden. <laughs> if you know the weather, what it's going to be, well, then you might be the man. Oh, well, um, we, Melbourne, how would you know? We could, pop, we could get Jane Bunn on the show um, right. and have a little bit of a discussion with her and <laughs> get, get the threats of El Nino and La Nina and bring it all she's, together and see what it's going to be on Cox Plate Day. Um, she's very good. She's very good... Um, weather presenter because she's actually a uh, what's the word she's a qualified um meteorologist meteorologist, meteorologist correct so she's uh she'd be perfect and uh, they remember years ago they used to have before jane and uh, they used to just get the girl that was doing the um uh what it just a news report she'd come on and just do the weather as well i mean it just uh, changed so much but she's yeah she'd be good if we can get uh, get hold of her three weeks out for all these um weather updates it'd be good yeah we can we can we can definitely do that there's um we can get anyone on here. We can get you, we can get anyone. <laughs> True. <laughs> now, are you able to tell us about uh, some of Fred Kersley's rides in Victoria this week? He's got a nice one in Mount Popper, and I would assume with a number of jockeys, A, not able to come from Sydney, and B, suspended because of an illegal Airbnb party, Fred might be one that could get a Melbourne Cup ride this year. Uh, well, we hope so. I mean, he's... He's, uh, I've been so impressed with Fred. Like, he's he's working so hard, like, really hard. Like he's, you mightn't see him on race day with, you know, 10, eight rides or whatever it may be, but that's not for want of trying, you know. We're trying to, do, um, you know, trying to build his profile, trying to be, you know, more often, than, more often than not, really trying to build his relationship with the trainers. And that's what he's doing. He's going to track work and he he's, um, and I'm getting really good, or he's getting good feedback. Uh, about you know his riding and he's got nice hands and and uh, he's but it doesn't matter whether you you might have all that but it's still the work ethic and that's what he's got and he's working really hard and getting some opportunities from trainers I mean I mean that's the thing about the jockeys that really you you're in the hands of the owners and the trainers I mean they're so so important to a jock I mean he could be the best but if he's got the wrong attitude well it's going to make it hard for him to be you know, one of the leading riders uh, but look Fred's Fred's doing well. He's, he's trying hard. He's got some good rides this uh, this Friday night. Uh, he's riding uh, Mount Popper. Uh, Mount Popper, you know, it's it'll improve. I mean, it ran an away for age race the other day, the uh, Maccabi Diva, and now it's now it's going into the um, up to a distance more suitable, and it can and, a, and it can race pretty handy. And I think the Valley generally on this meeting, you want to be up there a little bit, depending on the wind factor. But generally, you want to be up there somewhere in the first four or five, I reckon, and it gives you the striking distance. And that's where I think Mount Popper will be, somewhere near the lead. Another one, Mr. Mozart, who he, mm. he won uh, the Flemington race, the um, stakes race recently. So they're two good, uh, really good chances for Fred. And Fires, the other one who um, who he won on at Bendigo, was pretty impressive. So I think he'll, uh, he'll you know, race pretty well. Uh, there's a bit of speed in that race, but I still think the horse can uh, quit itself fairly well in that race. Yeah, great ride by Fred to knock off um, Asa, uh, not Asa, um, uh, Ayrton. Sorry, I get the I get Asa and Ayrton mixed up all the time. Just Artorius, Artorius, Artorius. It was sorry, yeah, yeah um, Artorius and um, and uh, the horse who finished third was pretty unlucky. Um, Halal, Halal was um, didn't have much luck at all. It was a bit keen and it only went down a half length. So you know, there's full of merit that uh, I thought that performance was. So I, yeah. yeah, I mean. Mr. Mozart, I think, you know, on pacer around the valley, that doesn't look to be stack of speed. So um, I think it gives him a good chance to win the start. Have you got a best bet this weekend? Uh, I haven't narrowed it down as yet for the uh, for my best bets. Uh, I've still got one race to go, actually. I'll do that tonight. And then I'll start on I'll start on the um, the meeting at um, on Saturday at Sandown. So 
Uh, most of my work's done at night time because I've, I'm doing a lot of the jockey stuff during the day. And at night time, I can uh, spend a lot of time doing the, uh, doing the form. Well, the good thing about when you do form and you, and you know it, the last thing you want is a distraction because you're concentrating yep. and it's if you if you're not concentrating a lot you can miss things and and I think that's that's the thing I mean you need and I think at, in the daytime it's harder to have a uninterrupted look at the form I mean uh, from my point of view my job uh, so I at night I don't tend to get uh, get the odd trainer who might call up about uh, a race you get that every now and again um, but generally it's just clear running for me at night and I can focus solely on the um, on the race meeting I'm looking at Last question from me. Um, yep. If you're having a weekend off and um, you don't want to put the time into the form, which tipster are you uh, following their tips for the weekend? Uh, that's another thing. I respect a lot of tipsters. If they do the work, I respect them. Um, I, I'll never look at a tipster's um, selections. Say, I, say I'm still working on, my, on the form and I know that some of the tipsters have already put there. So I might be watching TV and... Um, you know, some of the racing.com boys might be putting their tips out. I'll turn, I'll change the channel. I don't want to be influenced by anybody because yeah, I might, I might not be the best judge, but I've got to, you've got to believe in yourself and believe what you do and what you see, so, because so many times you can get distorted. You, 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 you help in on something. And then someone says, hey, you know what, you know what it did the other morning at track work? What's his name <laughs> was talking. I, I heard him on Twitter before and it ran so 33 yeah. seconds for his last in his, you know, 600. And then all of a sudden you start second guessing yourself and all that. So I'd rather not hear anyone's opinion until yeah. I've done the form. Then, yes, I will listen to people. I, I mean, I can't go past Dean Lester. He's, yeah. uh, he's does, I know how much effort and time he puts into the form. So I really respect uh, Dean. But I respect a lot of the, I, I see a lot of the, um, even the younger guys coming through, you know, they might put out, I don't look at everything, but it's, sometimes they might say something that I say, hang on a minute. Yeah, he's right there. I mean, you mm. can miss, there's so yeah. many things you can miss. So yeah. I'll pick up on lots of different things that someone might say. I mean, they might say, oh, it worked. I might have missed it, that it works somewhere and they've got video of it and these sort of things can happen. So I'm always taking, you know, taking everything in I can even mates of mine that are very good form students, they'll call me. They just they do other jobs, but they're also form students. They'll call me and they'll say, um, "Have you put this in your numbers?" And I'll and I'll sometimes I might have left it out, and I say, "Mate," and I'll go back and look at it. He's right. I should have put mm. that in. You know yes. that sort of thing. Yeah. So so I never dismiss anybody. But Dean Stick comes to mind because I've you know I basically grew up with Dean, you know, I'm, uh, you know, we, I remember seeing Dean at the races at Cram and back in the eighties when I was doing the stewards films and, and Dean was getting around the tracks. So, um, you know, we sort of, uh, in a way grown up together through, um, through the same sort of era. I mean, he's, I think we're a similar sort of age. So, um, yeah, I mean, Dean, I mean, I, but even guys, when I used to, we used to go to the racetrack and that I'd, you know, I'd talk to you, Damien, at the, in the, in the, the room at the press room, I'd, We'd often talk about, you know, just uh, what do you like today, and you'd give me your reasons or whatever. And so, you know, I don't. Of course, I'll take it on board. I mean, but if someone's just saying, "Oh, mate, I reckon this will win," and there's no, but they give you nothing else about. I mean, anyone can say that. I mean, I told you to win afterwards, you know, and you've done an hour and a half form, and you didn't pick the winner, and the bloke picked it in two seconds. That happens. Yeah, so we know that. But but yeah, it's um, I like to know the person that I'm talking to has done the work. When I when you're talking about you know, going with their selections or wanting to know what they think. Yeah. You need to know that they've done the, done the, all the homework they can. And then and then that way you got confidence in, in what you're doing. And then if, say, Dino likes it and I like it, well, then I've got to like it, though, really. I mean, <laughs> if, if, but if he likes it as well, that's just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I, mean, yeah. I know that, um, you know, Peter Ellis, another guy I used to, you know, I, mean, I don't speak to him as much as I used to, but Peter's a very good judge. And, and he, you know, he'd... Um, you know, I used to walk the track with Peter a fair bit, and he'd, um, you know, he'd come up with some some horses, you know, like a bit left of field, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, I might, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of start thinking, maybe I'll throw that in, you know, and sometimes it'd, it'd lob and whatever. So yeah, so there are, I mean, just because I didn't put it in my numbers, doesn't mean that um, you know it's not going to win. You know, another thing I I do, I send out some numbers to people, just friends and whatever, and I tip my, my four numbers. That mark, they don't know my. I haven't put the market with it, so I might have four numbers, and they're all say six dollars, six fifty, seven dollars, seven fifty. That's how I mark them. The next number could be seven, uh, eight dollars, 
and next one eight fifty. So I'm leaving them out of the of the four, and now I'll you know mates ring me up and they'll say, how come you left it out? How did you leave it out? It was eight dollars or not? I said, mate, I had it fifth pick. It was eight fifty. <laughs> but how do you want me to put in on my you know how many numbers do you want me to put down? Yeah. And, where do you draw the line with all that sort of stuff? So I think that having a market, and I know that a lot of people put out there their, their prices and their and their and whatever and their and, and and so people can have a look at it and then work it out. Oh, that's yeah, I'm gonna back the overs here or whatever it may be. That's fine. The only thing I find that when you've got companies that are doing it, a lot of they're usually using a few people. So you're getting this bit of information from that person, from that person, this one from that. If one person does one race. I'm I'm happy with that. Not so much. Oh, you know, what's your speed map for that? I'd rather that person does that race, and then he another per. I don't care if another person does the other race. Yep. But that way, you know that he's focused on that race solely, not getting other information from someone else who's throwing him all this uh, this info. But it's a lot. It's a lot of work, as you know. It's so so much. Um, yeah, sitting there in front of a computer, you got to get up and walk every you know half an hour or so just to stretch your legs and. And get the blood going through you because it's um it's not ideal to be sitting down. You can die in a chair, of course. Yeah. They don't want to be sitting there all day long, every day. Just um, you know, it's pretty um, it can be pretty um tiring. Or you get your your eyes get tired and all that sort of stuff. But you know, we wouldn't do it if we didn't really like it. Yeah. We've got ego. We all got egos, and we all want to want to pick the winner. I mean, how good is it when you find a That's winner? It. That's Even it. Even if you got one person, I mean, it's such a big thing, and you want them to ring you and say thanks, mate, for that. You know, that was uh. That was great, you know, and it, it makes you feel good. Even though if you didn't back it, mm. if you helped a mate out and he backed it, it's a really good feeling. Yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful with um, your mates, whoever you're sending the numbers out to with the uh, forward message on the uh, oh. numbers on the weekend. Because I'm telling you, there's always someone at the Moala uh, Ski Club who's either got <laughs> guesties set or he's got um, Mark Hunter's set. They've, and they come up to you and they say, oh, I've got Mark guests uh, numbers here, mate, if you want to have a quick little look. <laughs> in the in the bin, but uh, yeah, I can imagine that. And I know someone at Mel Whaler, so I reckon I know who you're talking about. Oh, but, you, uh, might, you, might you first it. put them under the bus. Uh, but I, I I don't care about that. I've, I've said to them from the start. If you want to pass it on to someone, you know that's fine. I mean, it doesn't bother me. You know, I oh, know no, they're pretty the fruit. They keep they keep their cards close. But if you yeah. want to, they just give you the phone a quick little look and yeah. I mean, I don't. try and there's, I know that I can. I can generally find things at, at really good odds, especially you know when you do the prices and you work out what's what's a really good um, uh, uh, you know something that might might be right value. Like last week, last week I had that chassis going. I know I know La Mexicana was unlucky, but I had that chassis going fifteen dollars. Like I was I was pretty sick after the uh, the race. I thought it would have been gone back a bit further. Like I wouldn't have thought you in twelve hundred meter race would be right up on the on the speed. I, I don't know what you guys thought, but I just thought you might have settled back. A little bit and and be where Willow was on Bella yeah. Nipatina, and that would, would have the race would have been a totally different race with that that happening. But anyway, look if if, she, if that's you know what, what that's happens. that's what happens, yeah. right? You you spend all your, all that time on it, and then the horse settles in a different spot than where you expected. And... Yeah, I can tell you a quick story. I was at Werribee Races in 1991, and I was you know I was doing the stewards films, and and it was packed. And the doubles bookmakers were very big back then. You know, there would be bit, throngs of people around them betting on the on the doubles books and i like this horse i told my mates the night before i said i really like this galloper today blah, 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 blah. i ran sort of geelong in the geelong cup geelong cup day in a um you know a plus one whatever it was and i said you should back it so my mate called me the next morning he said i'm not backing it it's 100 to one i said mate i'm telling you i think it'll go really well anyway i get to the track and i'm in the tower and I was about to go to the tower and I thought, gee, I haven't got much time here. So I went to the doubles books to put this bet on. I like one of Marconi's, uh, Jim Marconi's, in an earlier race, Classy Road. It was $15. It was Werribee Cup Day. It was, it was packed. I mean, Werribee was just chocolate. And and the other one was Zast, but they only offered $60 in the doubles books. That's 900 to one double. So I'm waiting in line and I'm thinking, I'm looking at my clock and my watch going, Buddy, there's only five minutes to go for this race. You know, Zast is about to run in this distance race. They started down the straight. So I said, bugger it's not going to get up anymore. I'll just, I've just got to go and film the race. I couldn't miss it. I mean, I'm working. So I went up the tower and I yelled down to a mate of mine. I said, you get on, you know, cause he was trying to put the bet on as well with his own bet. For the he said, nah, I didn't worry about it. You wouldn't believe it. Zas wins and pays $131 and classy rogue won at 15s. And here's me with my $50 
to put the bet on. Uh, it's just anyway. That, that's um, a bad luck. That's a yeah. That's not a good story to tell. Yeah. Really. It we'll all have them. I reckon Hayden and I would have our fair share. Yeah. We can share them one day, I reckon. Yeah, Mate, I got a potty some... last year, paid 200000 but I only I only got a, a little percentage of that. But I only took it for about 50 bucks, and I paid 200000 at Caulfield. So I was um, I was happy. That's the last reasonable collect I, uh, I've had. I only hey, got I'll it, let, only I'll got it for 75%. Question, Not quite. No, <laughs> nowhere near it. <laughs> I'll let you ask the last question, Hayden. No, oh, have we got anything there from um, our viewers that we need to ask? I know there was a couple there from um, a couple of real good ones there f that were regarding um, trips, etc. Times away. Yeah. Um, there might be a few people there trying to set Guesty up, trying to put him on the spot. So yeah, there would be. Put him up. Yep, I'll, I'll ask him quickly. A Luke Buller wants to know how do you get your hair to look so uh, perfect twenty four seven, uh, Guesty. Uh... Hashtag Luke, Silver Luke. Fox. Yeah, Luke. Um, yeah. Um, how do I get it to? No, I just push it back. It's simple. He knows that. He's just. <laughs> he's just having. I've known Luke a, a fair while. He, I met him at the Mooney Valley races many years back, and he's. He's. Um, his fiance is Katie O'Neill, who's Joe O'Neill's daughter, and uh, good friends of mine. So um, it's good to see they're tuning in and and, and watching and. And these blue boys aren't going that well this year. So um, being a Collingwood supporter, I'm not so unhappy about that. Um, but yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a good scout and he's, um, yeah, they, they um, get a few winners there. The, uh, the prime, uh, the prime th thoroughbreds, don't they? With the um, blue, they with do. the white star and the red, uh, red cap. But thanks for that, Luke. Yeah. Ruby Saki is probably one of their, their better yeah. ones. Cole, Cole Thompson uh, reckons his pop has told him some great stories about you and his pop in Hong Kong. Yeah, well, that uh, what the old go, goes on tour stays on tour. I um, yeah, that was two thousand and six. I reckon. I think he's talking about two thousand and six. That was uh, I've been there four times for those uh, international races, and that was the first time I went two thousand and six. And I remember, yeah, we had a we had a bit of fun there at uh, at uh, Lang Kwai Fong and also um, in Wan Chai. It was uh, anyone who's been there knows that it was it's it's great fun and. And uh, I don't run around as much as I used to, like I did back then. Um, but that was, um, I'd go back there in a heartbeat because it's uh, such a fun place. And you, you get away with people from the racing industry that you, you didn't really have that chance to, to sort of spend weeks with. You just feel it's just a different feel altogether, like when you're over there overseas. I mean, I love traveling. And uh, if I can go to a horse race meeting as well, which I tend to do whenever I travel, whichever country I go to, I try and get to the horse races. Not only one, you can claim it on tax. But um, you can get to watch some horse racing and see how it is in that, uh, in that part of the world. I think the only other one uh, there, Matt Gilbert reckons you've come a long way from your tipping days at Caulfield Races, Whips and Chains Bar. Yeah, well, Matty, Matty's helped me out over the years. I mean, because I, I did a bit of work at Caulfield. I, mean, I was working for um, the On Course one year, at, at doing the betting uh, one year there. And uh, I think Matty was working at Caulfield at that particular time. And he was, I think he employed me to do the, uh, the that Whips and Chains Bar I don't even know where that is. I think it's at the back somewhere near the um, where those owners are. I think that's where it is these days. But yeah, it's uh, I've had I've met some really good people in the sport, and and uh, a lot of people have uh, helped me out along the way. So I'm really appreciative of all the people that have really um, you know stood by me and and um, you know become friends over the years because I've made I made a heap of friends, and um, you know there's um, social media's a bit hit and miss as you know. You can get um, get people out there that don't really know full stories of certain things. But anyway, that's another that's another story. Yes, you've been very generous with your time, mate. We appreciate it. Hopefully the next geners have learned a little bit about how to do the form and how to uh, how to manage one of the best uh, jockeys in the country, mate, or the best jockey in the country. Thanks for your time, mate. It's hard work. That's all it is. That's all you <laughs> need to know. So uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Hayden. Thanks, Damien. All the best over the weekend, eh? Thanks, thanks mate. mate. Feel, feel free to sign off. We're just going to hang around for the last 10 minutes and go through our form for uh, some of the big races. Lovely. Thanks, mate. Catch up. All right, Thanks. Aiden, your take on the Moya Stakes. Guess he obviously likes Profiteer, but there's a couple of different form lines, as I said, Trekking and Wild Ruler coming through that run behind Nature Strip. And then you've got the trio um, last start at the Valley, uh, the Inferno, Portland Sky and September Run. And, and I think Ballistic Love is the other sort of X factor. Yeah, it is. Rail four metres, as Guesty mentioned, it typically is a um, meeting where on speed does dominate. Um, 
I think it was a bivouac who got pinned against the fence in this race. Um, was it last year or the year before? Um, typically, there's always a hard luck story. Rail four, circumference of the track. And race shape normally brings you down to something like that. So interesting race for mine. Velocity into the first corner, very interesting. Um, Profiteer, he's got no real 1,000-metre form. Uh, he looked, you know, he looked like a class horse as a two-year-old. He returns. Um, he does have first section speed. He's going to need it. He's also going to need to run a career PB. Um, so he's going to be there somewhere. Obviously, being up on speed is going to be very beneficial for him. I'm a little bit uninterested in the race. I think Wild Ruler will go up and um, he's the one who's going to get the ideal run in the race. He'll either sit outside of Profiteer or he'll sit one out, one back. Um, Daniel Moore, you know, could he get the two? Could he get two in um, six or seven days? He's you know, ridden his whole life to try and get a group one winner. Could he quickly turn around and get the second one? Once yeah. again, are we seeing group one races being run at group two level and group one races, you know, traditionally this would, it's got a bit of a group three feel about it, this one. Yeah. Um, I think you're a little bit harsh. I think it's a pretty good field. I'm a little bit suspect on the field, to be honest. Um, this is what the Everest does though, mate. It does. It um it does that, and it really stretches the sprinting um, stocks, doesn't it? The horse I was excited about, Ralph True, I'd be super keen. Um, but she definitely gets the right race, and she gets a race shape where she can be competitive if the boys get it wrong up on that dog leg first corner. Um, white Hot, Brett Preble, Brooklyn Hustle. She's my play in the race, but very, yeah. very small with a little interest. Yeah. What about I'm you? I was thinking a little sort of spread bet for interest on Wild Ruler and Portland Sky. Um, I, I liked Wild Ruler's first up run. As you said, I think he maps beautifully. Daniel Moore's got a bit of confidence. Um, and I thought the run behind Nature Strip was really good. Elevates again, um, certainly in the mix. And then I thought Portland Sky, Portland Sky went to the sort of number, um, sort of number that he did winning the Oakley Plate. Um, he'd be hard to beat here as well. And, and he's another horse that just puts himself in the run. I don't think he was disgraced by the Inferno. And some people will say, well, if you've got Portland Sky on top, you've got to respect the Inferno. I just think Portland Sky first up um, has, a, you know, second up here, I should say, um, but from that first up run has a bit of improvement to come. So I'll have a little spread bet at those two. At Wild Rule is seven fifty at the moment and Portland Sky is $11. So... Um, yeah, I'm happy to sort of bet around Profiteer at 390. Uh, Zaki looks like um, a standout clearly um, in the Underwood. Uh, can we bet in this race? Are you looking for um, little Quinellas or trifectas or anything like that? Uh, is it a race they pay for second? Is there a place dividend? Uh, there's no third dividend. So there is a place place dividend for second. I think Probabil is $1.45 to run top two. Superstorm three dollars to run top two. The chosen one four dollars. Fifty stars six dollars. Yeah, that's something that I I would contemplate. Superstorm um, to run second. That's a sort of race. Once I could really be sure of what the race shape is going to be, um, he's definitely a horse that I could step into. Um, as I said before, he's the horse in the race who's got the um, fastest four hundred meter sprint. Hmm. Um, and he's got the straight line speed to um, run a big race against the likes of those. So under those circumstances, he's not the horse I'd want to be um, in or around with a true tempo, but under those circumstances, there is some appeal for me, but it's not um, great at this stage. All right. And I'm conscious we've gone an hour. The Golden Rose, Animo's the $2.00. Favorite, um, we've got Artorias um, at nine dollars. So Remark at seven fifty in the Congo ten. Jamea fifteen. Startantes, who was a, a late nomination um, from Robert Heathcote in Queensland, nineteen dollars. Tiger of Malay twenty one. Giannis twenty three. Uh, does Animo just win here? I know we've spoken a little bit about Remark this prep. Artorias. You had a little question mark on whether the step up to 1400 actually suits or not. And in the Congo is one that has been running consistently well, maybe a bit of value at 10 bucks. In the Congo is the forgotten horse. Hmm. Um, I do expect Animo to win. 
it feels like a little bit of um, bivouac exceedance. Yes, yes, yes about these three. Um, yeah. I'm not where, convinced they're at that level yet. They're definitely not at that level yet. Mm. Um, but these are the type of races where that where this brings it out. So, you know, if they can skip... In saying that they're not to the level, the competition isn't going to be to the level either. So, you know, to win an Everest in that year, you had to run, you know, eight lengths above IVR benchmark. To win an Everest this year, you might have to go five or six. So even though they're three lengths inferior to um, back then, they are, you know, they're the three-year-olds that look like they could erupt. So... Animo, to me, I've got an expectation that he will win. Um, remark, I can't get over that first up performance. I think they were very, very easy on both these two horses at Kembla Grange. Um, definitely didn't stretch them, used it as a trial and a lead up, didn't want to bust them up. I think Remark raced flat also when the speed shift came on. Animo yep. went straight past him. Bowman really couldn't do much about it and just let him square at home his last 200. Today's grand final day. I've got an expectation Animo wins um, and he's going on to bigger and better things. But Remark's still got that profile where he could just be a monster. And you'll remember the Golden Rose last year where Team Hawks just had their two absolutely peak and Ole Kirk knocked off North Pacific in a photo finish and there was two lengths to the rest. So... This has grand final written all over about it for a Mark and Team Hawks. Oh, certainly. Um, yeah, he's just he's just a dangerous runner. Like he's got the, every part of um, what you require X factor wise to be a really good horse. He's just got to deliver the knockout punch. So you know, if he can bring it, he could easily win. Um, he could not only easily win; he could stamp himself as an Everest sort of horse. But he hasn't got anywhere near that yet. That's his yeah. little question mark. Yeah, I just got that feeling that Animo with two bucks is not, not like doesn't interest me at all. So um, I feel like I want to look around it, but I haven't settled on a position yet. I think in the Congo is a bit of value, and I think I think in the Congo and Remark are the two that I would be looking at to beat Animo. But um, yeah, it might just be one of those races that we just sit back and enjoy. Uh, any other races catch your eye? I'm conscious we've run uh, along here. No, we've probably um, covered what we need to do for this one. Guess the excellent person to um, have a chat with, you know, in terms of racing media, you know, he's a legend in the racing media game. You know, he's been around, as he said, for the best part of 20-odd um, years. So excellent to hear the way he does things. And just for the people who are listening at home, I think it's really interesting to hear the way that these guys do come up with their selections, do their pre-race, do their profiling, et cetera. One thing I am picking up on, and I've said it and I'll say it again, is I do have the luxury of having access to what I perceive to be the best analytical data in the country, um, you know, and we work really, really hard to produce that intel where the majority, the vast majority of people don't have access to it. Um, so for them to sit down and do their form, there are challenges. One thing I have noticed is that even me back before I worked with IVR data doing the form on my own, I was very statistical, very opinionated. Um, I'd look for raw statistics, who beat who, by how far, how much, try and throw a bulldust weight adjustment into it, et cetera, et cetera, and come up with a selection. Since I've moved to the IVR platform and doing what we do now, I've learned to profile horses, to understand that horses aren't all the same. They're not the same in every single race. They're not... Um, they don't have the reactions to weight that I once thought they did. Um, and they are different horses. The deeper and deeper they go into a campaign, they can bring it first up. They can struggle later in the campaign or, you know, the Chris Waller profile where they continue to improve and get better. One thing I am picking up on from David Gately's, from Mark Guests, et cetera, um, and from other fantastic analysts that I've picked up along the lines is if you are going to make it to the next level as a tipster and an analyst, what these guys are doing is subconsciously profiling horses. Um, they're watching replays. As Mark Guest said, something's really um, overlooked by the common punter. The common punter's looking last start, last 200, extreme focus on what's just happened. These guys are going back two years, three years. Let's work out what the horse's best is. 
and let's profile him off the campaign to see, is, are you heading in that direction or not? And can you get to there or is that beyond you? What level of expectation do I have now? Um, yep. We've got so much emphasis on what's just happened that the market can really fool the mother and the mum and dad punter, the common weekend punter, the market tricks them. Um, you know, we talk about it all the time. Horses start favourite, and I'll message on a Saturday and say, you know, couldn't back that horse in a million years. Ultimately, they get found out, and the overemphasis was on what they did last start. So I think people really need to listen to these guys because these guys have survived in an era where people didn't have access to data, people didn't have access to sectional times, services, et cetera, et cetera. The boys got in the ring and they got it done. Um, and it was basically the boys with the smarts versus the bookmakers. And the bookmakers had to do the same thing. So, you know, that's why they talk about the ring and how good a time it was. That's the reason. Yeah. No, I think you've summed it up well. Look, there are some people out there that find it um, easier to bet in the country at benchmark races. And maybe that's where their edge is. For me, I'd rather bet in the group ones because I find it easier to profile each horse. I know their profile because I see them in the group ones. I get to a, a Saturday or a Sunday, at, you know, you have a, a boys trip to Avoca at the races. you got no idea. You're having a guess. You're looking, you're looking at, like you said, the last two or three runs and having a punt. But um, I feel like, you know, that when we look at these good races, we're able to get a really strong read on how these horses profile and where they're going to sit in the run. And I feel like, um, I feel personally, I feel like I, I have better results in those races because I know the horses. There are some races, even on a Friday night or a Saturday, where I'll just say, I don't know this horse coming in from New Zealand. I don't know this horse that's been running in the bush in New South Wales. In the end, there are too many of these horses that it's not a betting race for me. Or or as Gator said last week, bet to have fun. Don't, don't bet to try and make it serious. Bet to have fun. Um, and that's what we try to do. Here, so I uh, hope, hope the uh, listeners got some joy out of that. We'll post some tips on the page tomorrow, just our insights. Um, I've got a couple of exciting things coming up for Next Geners. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, not the super coach, but the super horse racing uh, stable starts next week. So we'll start a little comp um, that you can get involved in on, um, on the starts Turnbull Stakes Day where you, Fantasy sports, pick your uh, pick your stable and back them in for the spring and trade them. And also um, coming up um, on Guineas Day, we're going to do a little competition where dress up at home in your race gear. Obviously, we can't get to the races. The MRC are going to donate a super box for the best dressed, and that'll be a super box for Caulfield Cup Day. So we'll have a bit of fun in a couple of weeks where we can dress up and get a bit of action on social media. Um, a few things to keep an eye out for. But this uh, show, if you don't want to sit there and watch us for an hour and a bit, you can listen to us um, chuck in the ear pods on, uh, on iTunes or on Spotify. Good to chat, mate. Good luck on the punt this weekend. Enjoy, mate. Thank you. Catch you, mate. Bye.